Good afternoon to Your Excellency, respected guests, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Chotirat Mongkon Chotirat. It is my pleasure to serve as moderator for the eight distinguished adjunct faculty seminar, which will be delivered by Dr. Bindu Lohani. On behalf of AIT, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to all of you. Um, we appreciate you taking your time off your busy schedule to join us. We hope that you will learn a lot today. First of all, we are pleased to have our Vice President for Administration, Professor Kaso Yamamoto, to deliver the opening remarks. Very good afternoon, and I'm, uh, I'm very pleased to have this kind of short opening remarks because uh, our trustee, the AIT, and then the senior AIT alumnus, and the respect for uh, Dr. Uh, Indu Lohani, uh, he will give us a very important lecture here, and then uh, this is, uh, uh, we call it Ed of uh, distinguished adjunct uh, lecture series. And then, uh, because I'm environmental engineer, he's my senior. And then, uh, then uh, I, yes. And then uh, I learned a lot from Dr. Lohani. Uh, because uh, uh, we had almost, uh, because he's very senior and then know very much well uh, environment engineering. And also he is uh, uh, leading of the uh, Asian Development Bank a long time. And then we, we are very much uh, to learn from Dr. Lohani. And then title is uh, Building a Knowledge Economy in Asia the role of the knowledge-based institution and the relevance to AIT. So please give us your lecture. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Professor Yamamoto, for your kind remarks. Now, please allow me to introduce a brief background of our guest speaker today. Dr. Bindu Lohari is a member of the AIT Board of Trustees, and he currently serves as the head of the Global Climate Change Practice Senator Group at the USA. He was Vice President of the Asian Development Bank for Knowledge Management and Sustainable Development. Prior to joining the ADB, he served as Chairman and Associate Professor of the Division of Environment Engineering at AIT. To begin this seminar, it is my pleasure to call upon our guest speaker, Dr. Bindu Lahani, up on the stage to give his lecture. Please welcome Dr. Bindu Lahani. Thank you. Uh, like the Sovereign Chairman of the Board, like the Warsak, the President of the Institute, board members, faculties, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's once again a great pleasure. I say once again because I delivered one before. Uh, to stand before this audience and really share some intellectual ideas uh, at a time when I think to me, Asia is really emerging, emerging fast, finding its course what to do, uh, just like this morning we were thinking about AIT. I've done this kind of uh, financial 
business development, income development, the growth development kind of uh, discussions with uh, many finance institutions in the, in the various countries, but try to relate to the academic institution and knowledge institution is one of my first. So what I'll be sharing will be some of my views, which uh, I hope will be challenged and also I would get some advice from you on your own views on how we should be thinking in future. The reason for doing this topic is the following. Many of the countries in Asia, if you look at the last three decades, they've done extremely well in terms of the economic growth. Least developing, developing countries have become middle-income countries and the middle-income countries are not trying to aspire to become high-income countries like the OECD countries. The path from least developed countries or developing countries to middle-income countries, it appears, is simpler. But once you read the middle-income countries like Thailand, Indonesia, Malaysia, etc., etc., how to break that path to become the rich country like the OECD in the Western countries is a big challenge. And therefore, there are many, many things you need to do. One of the area is the importance of knowledge. And this is what I'm trying to focus today. I'm gonna talk, talk about three areas. I'm gonna first introduce Asia. Now we all may say we know Asia, but it's good to revisit Asia the past, <clears throat> the present, and the future. And then second, how to build this knowledge-based economy from the traditional economy that most of us were used to. And finally, what is the role of the knowledge institutions in helping the countries to become knowledge-based economy and what that might mean to institutions like AIT. The last part, of course, you will probably know more than me. Uh, my presentation today is based on my own experience of working at the ADB last 30 years, before that, 10 years in the academics, few years in the government, all put together in, in the context of Asia. So obviously my knowledge is limited to Asia. Let's look at the Asia past, present, and the future. I put the slide which we developed at the Asian Development Bank when I was there, past and emergence of Asia. Back in 1820s, none of us were there, I think, in the 1820s, right? Back in 1820s, before the Industrial Revolution, Asia accounted for 60% of the world economy, 6-0. In the following two centuries, 200 years later, Asia's share of the global economy declined to 15%, 60 to 15%. Asia began to reemerge after the 1950s, first with the growth in Japan, then the newly industrialized country like Taiwan, Singapore, Hong Kong, etc. And later in the 1980s, by the growth of China, India, Indonesia, Vietnam, and Thailand. Today, Asia's share of global GDP is about one third, about 28, 30%. So from 60%, we went down to 15%, back to about 30%. This is the Asian past. So I like to call this as the reemergence of Asia. In one study that was done, how will Asia look like by 2050? 2050, another 23 years from now. The finding is Asia has the potential to have 52% of the global GDP, more than half the GDP from current 28%. And therefore, many of people and many decision makers have started saying this is the Asian century. 21st century, the Asian century. 
we have the possibility of having an average GDP about $40,000 per capita, which is very, very high. And this will be, this growth will be led by seven countries. The total GDP will be led by seven countries. That includes China, India, Indonesia, Japan, Malaysia, Republic of China, and Thailand. But it's not given. Some of the countries, if they don't take the right kind of policy, right kind of uh, leadership, governance, it's not natural. There is Vietnam waiting, and then there are many other Central Asian countries who are aspiring towards that. Therefore, if we are not able to take some of the challenges ahead of us, which we call mega challenges, and Asia is, doesn't take the right kind of leadership and the governance structure, the whole, the development, the GDP could, could come down to 32%. From 28 to 32% is not a growth. And that's, a, many of the Asian countries will fall into middle income trap. Countries, and there is some history in the past, some have already done that. So what are some of the regional and the mega trends that we should be aware of? Uh, there was the study again, I was a part of the Centennial Group, which did this study called World 2050. How will the, what will be the big challenges of the world? And some of these global challenges are the challenge of urbanization. And in Asia, 60 to 65, 70% of the Asian will live in the urban areas by 2050. 70, 80% of the GDP will be in the urban areas. The young people don't want to go to the rural areas. So urbanization is a huge global trend as much as the Asian trend. Demographics. Some countries are aging. Some have younger people with lots of dynamism. Some have a lot of youth but no skills. So you have to really have a different kind of demographics to work with in each country. The third is the rise of the middle income. One of the best things that has happened globally and to the Asia is the middle income, proportion of percentage of people in the middle income bracket is growing. And the technological progress, unbelievable progress we have seen in this century. The communication revolutions, climate change and sustainable development. These are likely to be some of the mega trends of the future. In another study that I think this was done by us, a similar trends. The disparity for the Asian, still there are poor countries, least developed countries, and the disparity between the rich and the poor is getting wider everywhere, including in the United States. And it is more critical in some countries because the poor poverty is still high. You know, in tech countries like Philippines, which has done well, but it's 25% uh, people under poverty, below 1.25. Take my country in Nepal, 26% of the people are below poverty, and there is the rich. So the disparity is creating a different kind of problems to the decision makers. Avoiding the middle income trap, not falling into the trap which many countries have fallen in the past is another challenge. Global warming and urbanization are some of the challenges that are there. To me, so I put all of these various studies, there have been a lot of studies, I put this together. One of the few things that might be relevant for Asia and to AIT also. Uh, this is, of course, we may differ and we can do our own exercise on this. To me, urbanization is a big issue. We can't get away from this. How to make cities livable, uh, how to make it smart, clean, green, and also opportunity for employment. The global climate change and sustainable, sustainability issue in every field. Use of technologies on one hand, and the ICT on the other hand, both go together. Focus on middle income class. We must, as I keep on saying, avoid this middle income trap. And the economic transformation, convergence and regional cooperation integration. What's happening is, the, most of the countries are converging. The ASEAN is a big block today. OECD was another block. So countries' economic powers are converging and that forces us to do, be, have regional cooperation and regional economic integration. Having said that, there are a lot of things we can learn from Asia. Learn good lessons and avoid bad lessons. And this is a chart which shows 40 years of economic growth of Asia on a per capita basis. 
40 years. And you, we can see the success of Korea and Singapore here. Look, in the first 10 years, everybody was almost the same path. Every country was here. And then they start taking off. And some countries have broken this million income trap, like Singapore and Korea, which I have shown it here. Whereas other countries are continue to remain like that. Look at these two countries, and I can show that in the next chart, maybe a little better. These two countries, in 1960s, Philippines and the Sri Lanka, 1960s, Philippine economy was only next to Japan, second best economy in Asia, better than Korea. Philippines used to provide, went and built some bridges and provided some grants to Korea, for which they are, they are grateful forever. But what happened in Sri Lanka too was really one of the candidates which should have become a much better country. But what happened in the last 30 years, they remain on the strap. And this is what we countries need to avoid. You may go here and some countries may get trapped here in the middle income area. And this means for Asia to avoid the kind of situation that some of these countries went through of bad governance, wrong investments. They did investment, the wrong investment. The cronism, the lack of vision and the leadership. And, and conflicts. If countries get into some of those again, our Asian century will not materialize and many countries will stay in the middle income trap. Now this chart is learning from the stages of development. If I, if I put all this development in Asia over the last 40 years, one can put in these five stages. The first stage is of course agriculture. Still many countries are here, poor countries. Second stage is they may do simple manufacturing. Third, the supply chain manufacturing. That's what. Then you go on to the high tech, technology absorption, technology intermediation, et cetera, where Korea, Singapore. And then you move on to the next level, which is the creative economy, knowledge economy. So knowledge economy means moving from agriculture, industry, to high tech, to eventually a creative economy. Uh, one, one weird example, or maybe the right example, but the right example is, who had thought 10 years ago that the K-pop will bring so much business to Korea? K-pop is a pop music. Today, is, it's a creative thing. I mean, they found out that this is, this is really business, games, media, a whole lot of things. Now, what I also want to mention here is, I had watched a presentation here uh, done by one Thai minister or so, called Thailand 4.0. So I read that. And then I tried to relate. Uh, the 1.0 1, 1 to me there is this one. His two is this two, two A and two B. The three there is here, and the fourth is here. Uh, to me, when I start playing, where I would put Thailand, Thailand is somewhere definitely here, but also moving a little bit of here, but not fully here, to me. Because in the third, what you, 3.0, what you need is, you need to be able to absorb the technologies, not only have the FDI, but you should be able to do 100% yourself over a period of time. Somebody may come and uh, build a television, but then you should be able to do 100% by yourself with the technology you have. If you can do that, then that is to call technology absorption. And Korea has done that, Singapore does that, but initially with the FDI, but eventually taking it over by developing its own manpower. And what we're talking today is moving from here to this knowledge economy, where it's no longer the factories, it's no longer just the industries, you are using your creativity for knowledge. And I also read in that 4.20 Thailand, quite good, he talked about trade-induced transformation, investment-led transformation, policy re reconciliation, and restructuring the public sector. But what I'm to doing today is I'm taking the knowledge side only. A very limited presentation from that angle.
Now today, it's, people are also talking about the fourth industrial revolution. Those people who have been attending, who might have attended Davos meeting, might have seen, talk about the fourth revolution. The first revolution was, of course, the steam engine, you know that, then the electricity, the third revolution, electronics. Now the fourth industrial revolution is on cyber physical system. How, what's the interface between machine and man? Artificial intelligence, internet of things, and things like that. So the driver to that is, there are two drivers to that. One is the social, social factors, demographic and social factors, things like like we talk, middle income uh, class is emerging, 23%, that's a very powerful block. Climate change, another powerful block. Women economic power, empowerment. There's a lot of studies, including what we did when we were in LAB. What is, how can you increase the GDP of the country by putting women to workforce? Now, this is a study they did in Japan and many countries to see you can raise the GDP quite a bit significantly. So there are new such opportunities in the socio, social factors which will be in the, in the fourth industrial revolution. The other side is the, the technical, technological factors. Technological factors are things like processing power, to the enormous po processing power, the big data is gonna be the number one in that. The new energy supplies, not only renewable, the technology, a whole lot of thing happening in this. Internet of things, this, everything will be internet of things. The life will be guided by internet of things. The sharing economy, the young people don't want to buy a car. They say today if I want a Rolls Royce, I will rent a Rolls Royce from Uber, go for a date, and next day I don't want, I'll have a small Honda. So they have choices of this whole sharing of economy. Uh, children like ours are saying, I don't want to own an apartment, I have Airbnb, I, I live where. So there, the new, new kind of opportunity, new kind of thinking coming. The robotics, which is an interface between the man, the person, I should say, human being, and the, the artificial intelligence, etc. So there, there are the drivers on the fourth industrial revolution. The question is, do we know what will really happen, how to do that? We don't. But we have to start making sense on wh which of these are relevant to us. Like to me, for example, energy technology is definitely something I would put my money on. I'll put my money on big data. I'll put my money on sharing economy, artificial intelligence, etc. Because those we know we see the dim light on that one. So that brings me, so we saw the agriculture, industrial, industrialization, and the knowledge economy, so which is the service sector. One important thing in the whole process of the development is transformation, structural transformation. When does the country do this structural transformation and how do they do that? And here's an Asian picture. Asia is still the largest employer Agriculture sector is still the largest employer in Asia. We know that. Asian growth is high in manufacturing outputs, but less in employment. In order to measure the efficiency of the industrialization, you, you look at least two parameters, the output and the whether you employ the right people. You have in Asia lots of output that happen in China, but employment low. In the case of and some countries have gone directly from agriculture to the service sector, and they end up doing the low-end low -end service job, not the high-end job. That's been the experience of Asia. So one of the most important aspects of structural transformation is industrialization. And here you need to know when to industrialize, when not to industrialize, and when to deindustrialize. And just to give an example of the OECD countries, the OECD countries first industrialized long time ago, and, and then they started deindustrializing in the last decades already. So we're really far behind in terms of their thinking. Their manufacturing went as high as 25%, and they lowered it to half, so that they can move into the high-end service sector. An Asian example is like this. 
you you see the countries which are needs to which needs to de, which has decentral de industrialized these countries are beginning in terms of the output or the employment if your output is too high employment is low you start the in sliding here and improve here or the the countries which have not deindustrialized here in terms of the output and the employee and this is which did not industrialize need to do more so you see example like philippine here that we think we need to industrialize more create more employment in the in the uh, industrial sector and you see thailand somewhere else so these this is there's a whole lot of detail analysis on this but the key thing is to see when i industrialize i industrialize so much and when i need to deindustrialize to move into the higher end product therefore the key message from all of this is what i'm trying to build the case is becoming a knowledge based economy will will have the challenge of relocating the labor which is maybe in agriculture then simple manufacturing to the high end industry and eventually the service sector how do you manage those kind of skills is the education skill development sector without which if you industrialize or deindustrialize without linking that human angle then there are consequences of that and finally middle income country like thailand indonesia malaysia etc if they want to go to the high end side one critical role they have the study shows is innovation assumes a very very critical role this brings me down to the next topic how to build this knowledge based economy there question is what is that what is knowledge based economy how why it is so important for us and how we can do that first what it is it's very simple in order to get into the knowledge based economy you need to get into these four things very well you need to have quality higher education and skills like if you want to go to this high end industries like semiconductors you better have people being trained for that otherwise fdi will come they will do the business and you become a black box right uh, secondly the research and innovation how to bring innovation in the in everything we do in teaching in in sectors agriculture industry energy how to bring in this innovation and that doesn't come without r and d especially with interface with the industries third is the ict and technology uh, we won't be able to do any business in future without getting into the ict and also knowing certain level of tech, uh, technology and the kind of policies whether intellectual property right or helping by the government to start knowledge hubs there will have to be government led policy without which this doesn't happen so these are the ingredients or the elements of knowledge based economy which countries should invest on i'm now talking in the context of countries in the case of knowledge based economy if you look at the oecd countries the developed countries 50% of the gdp today come from knowledge based economy 50% and that's what i think we need to even agriculture in most countries may give you for tell to 10% 20% but 50% coming from the service sector means you really have need to have some major change in thinking why does it need i don't want to elaborate too much on this but it's very very clear uh, look at all the countries with high knowledge economy countries which are in knowledge economy taiwan japan finland united states look at this circle and look at our circle in the uh, indonesia philippines which does which hasn't reached and there's a very big gap if we want to aspire to become a high income country we it's very clear you need to move up further and the second thing which is also clear is the countries which have very high knowledge economy or measured by index are not poor the poverty is almost zero like like here you find whereas the poor country like nepal etc the knowledge economy is very 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 small now 
what are the success stories in Asia, again, in this area? Where we can look for some of these good success? I'll mention three. And these are based on the research, by the way, so these are actual research to back up all of these. Now let's look at Korea. Uh, Korea initially started with R&D of about 0.5%, uh, and then increased by 2010, 3.7%, and then to 5%. Any countries which go up to 5% GDP for R&D is an OECD country today. It's one of the highest I have seen, about 5%. And without that, it's, there's nothing much you will develop without R&D. Every country, including Korea, they establish a super ministry of science, technology, and future planning. They're very important to move into science, technology, and if you want to get into the knowledge economy. You have a choice not to, but if you want to. The focus on ICT, huge focus is required on that. Focus on high quality education. That's what Singapore, Korea did it. I remember back in almost 1999, 2000, 35% of the Korean tertiary graduates, masters, PhDs, earned degrees in engineering, manufacturing, and construction because they decided they want to go into technology, they want to go into construction business, they want to go into IT business, and therefore the whole manpower was oriented towards that. And that created a lot of opportunity for the universities in Korea. And it also, in the beginning of that, the Koreans took a lot of help from the Americans in doing joint program to learn and eventually they digested 100% themselves. And this is the trick, not to be able to observe that yourself, otherwise you're on a black box framework. Singapore, I look at Singapore very carefully. We have a case study on this. Singapore's success is a great story of transforming from a labor-intensive growth. It was a labor-intensive growth in Singapore to a skill. They went to the skill-intensive growth. I can do this, I can do that. Two, they went to a knowledge and innovation economy-based growth now. And, and, and they're very, very successful. They also increased their R&D expenditures to almost about 2.3%, and they were telling me that they plan to increase further to 3.5% by two, 2015, and maybe more after that. So R&D is critical. And they also, just like Korea, had the role of the government. They have Economic Development Board of Science for Technology and Research, which was driving this from the top. It didn't happen without driving that. So Singapore uh, emerged as a hub of service today and further developed the new high growth service capacity. And the last one I want to mention is the Finland. 1950s, Finland was an agriculture-based country. 70, 80% agriculture, nothing. And then 1990 onwards, 40 years later, Finland established innovation-based knowledge economy. They said, we're gonna get into that. Strong support and focus on ICT, we know that. We know Nokia. And develop the human resources that we're gonna produce a lot of human resources in ICT, innovation sector, and get there. And if I remember at one time, the Nokia's income was much more than the whole country's GDP. So finding that kind of a niche was, but it needed a very strong directions to be led by top. Now, how has Asian country performed? I'm gonna go quickly, show some slides to see how are we today? How are many of our countries today? Uh, quickly, one, a knowledge economy index, if you look at it, we are far behind the OECD. Look at that, all countries, uh, except for Taiwan, Hong Kong, Japan, Singapore, and Korea, all other countries are far behind the OECD. But some countries are even far below the Asian average. And this is where Thailand is above average, but still has a lot to achieve in terms of the OECD. Uh, Philippines, this data of 19, I think two years ago, shows Philippines and Indonesia are below the Asia Pacific average. But the Asia Pacific average includes Japan, Korea, Taiwan, and Hong Kong as well. And, and to summarize all of these, Look, the higher education is extremely, extremely important. The quality higher education, not only degrees, but quality. And look at Korea where this is played. This is globally, by the way, globally. They're number two in tertiary education, high level, and, but their quality still is rated solo. Singapore is rated number one globally in terms of the quality of education, although the tertiary 
uh, enrollment and study may be less. And here are the other areas of innovation. The point I'm trying to make is there is a lot of gap for us to fill in, and we know the countries would aspire to do, go there, and that brings us opportunities, especially if some knowledge institutions are there, well prepared, or preparing towards fulfilling that role of providing service to the countries when they need one. Now, what's the role of the knowledge-based institution and relevance to AIT? Uh, this is some uh, random thoughts I put together. I'm going to talk about four areas, same four areas of the knowledge-based economy, education and skills, innovation, ICT, and economic reason. First, the education and skill. Now, if you look at the education and skill, uh, education data again, just to prove this point that we're far behind OECD, uh, we may be pretty close to the average, plus minus 10% up or 10% down. Uh, second, quality of scientific research institution. We are in most of the Asian countries, but there's a large gap again in the quality of research institution. Malaysia, India, Indonesia seems to rank a little bit higher than Thailand, but Thailand ranks Philippines. But I don't want to call this way, but basically saying we are pretty low very low compared to many other institutions, and we want to be moving up. Now, this is the data I want to put in, which uh, I had uh, worked with McKinsey on this to develop. What, what the study showed was the degrees versus skills. There are a lot of people who have degrees, but they don't have, seem to have the skill required by the employer. And they, 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 the McKinsey's study gave it to me, saying, even in a country like China, only 10% of the, this is, this is a little bit old data, 2005, I haven't asked the new data from them, only 10% of the engineers with a degree in engineering had the skill required by the employer to do the job on day one. Very frightening. And India, 25%, Philippines, 20%, Malaysia, 35%. Hungary, they say 50%. But it's, it's really bad in the case of the general field, like social sciences, it's even worse. So the point they're making is, is it a time to visit what we are teaching? Are we teaching the same thing that we taught before, which the employers don't want it, or asking for it? And the same thing is not only in Asia, it seems to be in the US. Now look at this chart. In the US, there are more jobs, the blue one, more jobs than than what they can fill it. And they, their main argument again is, we, don't, we, we can't find skilled people. People come with the degrees, certificates, but we don't have the skills required. So this is a problem, right? But having said that, uh, we need to find a solution. Before that, the actual data from the report shows 30 to 40% of the firms, these are the firms who recruit in Indonesia and the Philippines, report that the quality of the graduate is a concern. This is from the actual survey from the employer who are looking for people. Up to 35% of the firms in Malaysia, Mongolia, Thailand recognize that the lack of required technical skill is among the main reasons position go unfilled. In Vietnam, less than 15% of the college graduates have practical knowledge of the job they apply for. I think this is eye open now. We need to, for any knowledge institution, any academic institution, to see how to fill that gap. And then this brings me to me teaching, in addition to teaching, the importance of knowledge and learning. Now, in the knowledge, when I was the knowledge vice president, I had a difficult job of this how to get the tacit knowledge of the people and try to put in a codified or explicit knowledge, people can use it. There's a lot of knowledge we all have here, but how do you convert that into a knowledge which everybody can use it? I think this is a new work which we have to do, and there are ways to do that. But important thing is accumulation of the tacit knowledge. Tacit knowledge is here, the experience of the people, the knowledge of the individuals. How to accumulation of the tacit knowledge from the explicit or the codified information and technology can only be done by learning. And therefore, 
learning is more important than formal education. We were saying, are we teaching or are we teaching people how to learn continuous learning? How do you, how do you keep on learning? A skill to learn itself is different from the formal education. So in, in knowledge-based economy, learning by doing is paramount. Dr. Subin was showing during the lunch, he's from his cell phone checking the energy generation by a thin film, PV solar panels, another one. Learning by doing. That is a kind of important discipline in knowledge economy. And not only going back to the books. A fundamental aspects of learning is the transformation of, as I said, the tacit knowledge into explicit knowledge which is a challenge to any organization. This was a challenge to me at the ADB when I was vice president of knowledge. How do I get all these people who are about to retire? But they have a lot of knowledge and energy, transport, urban, uh, computer, and those guys don't want to share. To the extent that they didn't even share their PowerPoint. So I said, everybody's material is a property of the institution. And I learned this from the banking sector. I went to Barclays and I found out that whatever you produce in the bank, the bank already takes a copy automatically. You can't you can do anything, it sucks it, right? So the knowledge is in the maintain. Otherwise people retire and in ADB also, and then we had to look for this guy two years down the road. He's the only guy who knows what happened. So how, converting this tacit knowledge into explicit knowledge is really, in my opinion, very important. This is what the innovation, Shreya told me, Innovation Lab is trying to do this a little bit now, and I hope you are able to do this for the whole institute so that we know all the ideas of knowledge, everybody's into one place, which anybody can use. Uh, it took me about a year to convince, although I was the boss, to all my staff say, you must put all your climate change related slides in one place so that we have 10,000 slides, anybody can use it. It took me a year to convince, it's very hard. People don't want to share, but we must make it happen like that. Anyway, that's too, too long. Uh, next. next item is the innovation in the land. So what countries, uh, again here, just to be able to show you uh, the same story. We see similar trend in capacity for innovation uh, innovation, as well as the cap capacity for innovation. We are, uh, with the inclusion of Malaysia, Indonesia, India, Philippines, uh, they are good performance here, but how to build innovation on that is a different story. Research, university, industry collaboration, also very low compared to the OECD country, and which is very critical for innovation. How to do an industry, academic, university link up. Next brings to information and communication technology. Uh, emerging economies in Asia fear much more, much more than the OECD countries in the ICD sub-index. The question here is again, the same story. Same story. There's a lot for Asia to achieve towards being in the high income. I'm going fast on this because the same story is same. And next is on the economic policy. This is critical. If the government policy doesn't allow, if the government doesn't provide incentive, fund, doesn't create knowledge of it, doesn't happen. So its role, a policy regime by the government is very, very important. With that in mind, we did the study in four countries. Uh, China, India, Indonesia, and Kazakhstan, and see what, now this is now recommending them. What do they need to do if they want to get into the knowledge economy? And this may be applicable on a country by country basis, or we may need to do one like that for the country. And here are some of the actual results by talking to the countries, these four countries. Education and skill. Uh, we need to we need to be able to increase education for employment and employability. We saw that graph, skill versus degree. Work ready graduates for the present, but with a skill, learnability, ability to continuous learning so that they can tackle the issues of the future. 
It's a challenge to institutions like us. Developing flexible system of education, training and lifelong learning. PPP, I think in the education now, there is a lot of private public sector opportunities which the, in the past was considered as a public sector uh, activity. Leveraging the ICT, I'm a strong believer and every research, research has shown that we should take the advantage of massive open line courses MOOCs, Coursera, we should develop our own. A student should be able to sometime listen to the lecture in the, in the dormitory. I was giving a talk in Harvard and then uh, says, Professor, I cannot uh, join the lecture. I'm watching football game, but I'm watching you. And, and then he's sending me questions. So we have to be able to do that kind of thing. If a student doesn't come to class, it doesn't matter. If the student is learning, either anywhere the person is, it's okay. I think we must develop this for the future. We must, these are the, by the way, recommendations given to those four countries. Some are, this is a summary recommendation. Expand the center of excellence. No, you must in every country have a couple of center of excellences and there must be some world-class, world-class tertiary educations in every country. Every country, Afghanistan, Nepal, Laos, Cambodia, they deserve at least one, two, three, depending on the country, world-class education center. And this is now in the mind of the government. And I'm, so what I'm saying is based on the consultation of the government and our recommendation. In the innovation side, we should develop the innovation intermediaries in the country. So this is again a country-related concept. The concept of innovation lab. I think you have, I'm glad that there's one in, AIT, the countries are now developing several of these. They are developing several hubs in the countries. Public sector funding is important. Now countries which have not provided money from the top, uh, it hasn't happened. So then the private sector will join hand to make it happen. And finally, uh, I mentioned about the R&D, I'm not gonna say that again, but important also in the context of Asia to encourage frugal innovation, which is the innovation which is already happening in Asia from long time ago, traditional appropriateness, which has the possibility of turning into a global sales technology. There's a lot of Asian frugal technology. India is doing a great job on this, by the way. They're spending a lot of money from the government on this one. ICT. So recommend the countries, what they are thinking now is they all are trying to tap the power of the mobile phone. Mobile phone, for, we, we already know the mobile for shopping, banking, eating, ordering food, uh, money, et cetera, et cetera. And there is a lot of thing to do even today. Uh, let me skip that. Having said that, the, on the economic incentive side, there are two, th three things I want to say. One is improving the governance, the role of the government. I keep on saying this without that, nowhere, nothing has happened. Give an example of Singapore, Korea, etc. Tapping the global knowledge is important. The partnership with the world, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that brings me to the Next one, which is relevance and maybe some opportunity for AIT. Based on our discussions with the countries, one thing is for sure, the countries are gonna invest in this. Some will more, some will less. They will invest in R&D, all countries, especially middle income countries are more. They will invest in higher education. We saw that in the budget and the countries need. They will invest in IT. They will build knowledge institution and center of excellence the help of the government. In the old government's plan, particularly middle income country to, to wanting to be the high income country. Indonesia, I saw a plan for Indonesia, saw a plan for Philippines. Uh, I'm sure there will be, Kazakhstan had one and so on. So these are gonna happen. The question is, What do we do? Are, are these provide up? Of course, there are lots of educational need they want it. Uh, they certainly want higher education, ICD, R&D innovation. Do we have a role? Can we help? 
Because they're going to do that anyway, whether we, uh, whether we want or not. Do we have a role for that? If we want to, we need to refocus. We need to identify areas where of excellence where we can, uh, so that we can become the service provider, which we want to be. Uh, there's no choice but, but for us to become a world-class university or institution in some selected areas. I, I can say in all the areas, in some priority areas, depending on the country. The country wants this, country wants that, country wants that. That exercise is available, that information is available. It's a question of pulling together and say, okay, I want to be able to help Indonesia, Thailand, Philippines, etc., because they are going to do this. Do we want to position ourselves as a knowledge institution to that? It's a choice. Uh, we may not. So, how do you become this world class thing? Very simple. There's a whole research done on this couple of volumes of research, how to be a world-class institution. It looks like a very common sense thing. You need to have excellent faculties, excellent students, well, good governance, lots of money to be able to do this. Networking collaboration with the much higher institution or as well as institution in the, in the region, outreach and communication, and very high quality infrastructure. We must have the best infrastructure as well. So this is how, it looks like a very simple thing that we need to do. And therefore, I think uh, this morning, uh, we had a very good board meeting. The chairman, president was saying, we went through some difficult time. I mean, before I asked the question, uh, 2012, it was really, very depressing situation, flood, and uh, thanks to the leadership by the chairman, the president Warsak, I think it's really nice to see that we have come up. We, as, as the word was used, uh, strong footing. AIT has been brought to a very strong footing. It's stable. And I think the, the, it's, uh, it's really, we've got to congratulate the people involved, the management board, the sector who brought this level from it's like saying from ICU to bring to your room, and now we are in our home, so it's stable. It's, it's, it's really a great job. The question, therefore, at the moment is, with all the hard work the last this, this team has done, it's, it's question, time to question. Do we want to take the same business as usual approach and keep on growing in the same pace, or do we want to grow, as Professor Anand was telling me, Maybe time to take off? Do we want to do that? I mean, these are strategic questions. Business as usual, we still will be okay. We float it. Strategic, or do you want to grow and take off? Maybe are you saying in the business, some areas will go away because it's not making sense. This making sense, this new areas will grow. So these are the timing, I think, when we could probably ask this question, uh, do we need, do we wish, to prepare a farm, or do we want to do that for the future needs, some of the things that I outline in those areas where the countries would be asking help. And not necessarily from AIT, but they will be asking help or they will, either they'll be doing for themselves or somebody else. So the question is whether we want to prepare for that kind of opportunity. Uh, this, to do that, this is a, last night I put something, I hope it makes sense. Uh, we need to therefore time to look at the strategic vision, uh, recognizing all the good work done so far, to keep in the current needs of Asia as well as preparing for the future. It appears to me we need to be able to prepare the needs of the future, the, the current needs in many areas, infrastructure sector, which we know, as well as we need to probably keep in mind of the future and see whether we should start planting trees or start growing in that direction. Whether we need to be rearranging, reforming our programs towards that? This is a question for us. Whether we need to be coping with the technological gaps, the big data, machine learning, etc. This should be for every faculty, every student, every me and you, whether we need to be doing that. This, I think, is a great time to think about this because, based on what I showed you, this is gonna happen anyway. It's gonna happen in the countries. 
And so positioning AIT to be a knowledge-based institution, to be able to be a good service agent, agency for those countries' need is a question, I think, to visit. And then I need to say, okay, suppose if you want to do that, what do we need? Uh, and and I, I think it's very simple. Uh, it looks like we need uh, to hire a lot more excellent faculties in the priority area. Not everybody gets, not in every every field of study where we want to be. Uh, I, I believe the we need to somehow try to find three, four hundred more full scholarship because you know at a time when we used to give full scholarship, nobody used to give. Now today, China is providing that. New Zealand, Singapore. Korea, Japan, everybody's providing full scholarship. So we would be competing very hard with China and others to bring in those kind of students. Maybe we need to get, for the next four years, maybe a couple of hundred scholarship, 400 more maybe, I don't know, it's possible. The R&D fund, maybe every, every school need to be given a million dollars, so guys keep on doing research in some critical areas for the next four or five years, not $100,000 research, $1 million, $2 million research for the next $5 million, for the next five years. Produce something, a technological breakthrough, a new technology, something or the other. So providing fund for these schools. And high quality infrastructure, which is already happening, maybe you might need more in future. So this all needs money. So my calculation to the estimate last night, not for public quoting, is I came to something like 20 to 25 million dollar per year is needed for the next four to five years. And then you can really take off. Say, okay, we're gonna go into growth area. And it's like in the private sector, what you would call, this is the investment needed. I don't know whether we can mobilize or not, but this is what is needed. And then I asked for myself, can we do it? If someone asks you to do it, can you do it? And it appears to me, really, this is a doable dream. This is a doable dream. Question is whether we want to do it or not. Uh, thank you very much. I'd like to uh, answer some questions if you have any. Question, no question, good. Dr. Lohani, thank you for a very interesting lecture. I, um, had an interest in one of the earlier concepts that you put forth in terms of moving from an agricultural-based uh, economy into a more industrialized and so on. <clears throat> and then I think about uh, the where agriculture is going in the United States, as an example. In the United States now, Agriculture is a uh, very big business and very highly dependent upon high technology. For example, uh, the fields there are very big, but they, uh, the, the harvesting equipment, for example, the, um, uh, the operator sets the computer for where the and the GPS system for where the uh, equipment is to move and doesn't touch it after that. And it just, you know, it, it goes on its own and pretty soon we're gonna have completely driverless uh, equipment operating the, the uh, harvesting of, of crops on a very large scale. And of course, this is a, uh, uh, <laughs> It's kind of a, a contradiction there in terms of agriculture versus going into the technology and ICT-based uh, economies. So. Any more? I take them all, or I take one, maybe take a few more. No 
more. Yeah. Dr. Lani, you were faculty here, you were part of the management, you're back as a board member. You know, your vision for AIT to be the best in Asia, to participate in the knowledge economy. Um, what were three changes would you make or would you advise? I, I better say, not, not make. Would you advise so that our graduates can participate, be captains of industry, be policy makers uh, in this knowledge economy for Asia? Okay, there's two. One more. There, there. Dr. Lahani, thank you very much for a very interesting lecture. I was just wondering, uh, in terms of the last country to make the transition from middle income uh, trap to a higher, higher level economy, I, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, it was Portugal. So if, if there's, I just wonder if there's any lesson that the Asian countries that you described uh, may have uh, looking at the model of Portugal as an example of the last country to move uh, from the middle income trap. Thank you. Okay. Would I like to move? <laughs> Dr. Lohani, I think I have a very simple question. No matter whether we're in an education institution or private sectors, money is always the most important. And you have indicated AIT needs a lot of money. In your opinion, what will be the best way AIT can generate the necessary financial support? Where yes. to f find the money? <laughs> And the money. Okay. Okay, interesting questions. I think, uh, I don't think we have uh, definite answer, but we have views on this. Uh, Dr. Nelson's questions, um, you're absolutely right. I, 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 would, I was asked similar questions or by a colleague uh, one time in China. Mr. Lohani, what should we do with our agriculture? We have so many people working in agriculture. And my instant instinct was do like U.S. And then I, but then I have to say, but. Uh, certainly, let me preamble by saying, if you look at the Asian picture today, you ask your son, you ask your grandson, there is not a single child who will want to be in the rural area and be a farmer. Number one. And why? Why should he be, she be? Because if you have an opportunity like you and me to be professors, uh, bankers, the sector, why not? So they all are aspiring to do that, not to be the farmers in the traditional sense of planting rice, cutting rice, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, Dr. Nelson, you're right. So we have you have to modernize. You have to modernize. The future farmers will be machine. The farmer. So, and then you need to have young people will not be farmers, but they will be the CEO of the farm. It's okay. I have young people whom I know, they say, I'm now the CEO of the farm. I'm really able to manage my farm, get the profit, etc., etc. Because food will be needed, and people will be in that kind of business. The equipment, as you said, yes, certainly for that we need, mechanized, etc., which includes productivity, etc., etc., but the, you also mentioned the right thing, which is the ICT. When I said ICT, I'm not saying that we should train more and more computer science graduates' uh, degrees with the computer. We're saying people who would be able to make that ICT transaction in every field, energy, transport, agriculture, business, uh, online shopping, whatever it is. It is, ICT will penetrate our life. Just like technology will in future, mobile phone has already done that. So, but what I 
So definitely I agree with you. Say yes, driverless. I'll be the CEO of the farm. I go to my farm, mechanization, and then I sell the profit. I sell online. All of those new things will come. But the U.S. has uh, one thing which uh, I don't know how much many countries would be able to do. There's a plenty of subsidy U.S. provides for the agriculture. Uh, and uh, most of us who like to see that agriculture subsidy got away over a period of time. But that's a different story. But everything you said, that's the future of agriculture. Not a farmer, a CEO of a farm. I, I drive there, manage my farm, come. Mechanization, the sector. People bending and planting the rice and breaking the back, those will go away. There will not be people available for that. We must prepare for that situation. So that's my thing. Uh, and Surinder's question, I think you say, what are the three advice or three uh, to the new graduates? Uh, one, I think to me is, uh, you know, unless you want to keep on be in your laboratory for future, uh, my best advice to you is, is don't be proud of, I've got a master's degree, what skills I have? Just ask yourself, what can I do? Uh, I interviewed many people, I remember uh, in ADB, there, one man, director came and asked, oh, sir, I've, uh, he's, got a, he's got PhD, master's from every great school. And I said, uh, you know, you've been 10 years out of uh, education. What can you do? And the answer kept on saying, but well, I've got a master's from Berkeley, PhD from here, this one. So I said, I didn't ask the question. That was 10 years ago. It doesn't mean anything to me. Because what I had degrees 40 years ago, a professional license that I had, I can't do it today. So I said, what can you do now? The guy couldn't answer my question. I didn't hire him. So I like to, you like to be able to say, I, I can teach, it's, it's a skill. I'm a very good teacher. I can make good graphic you hire if it's a graphic job. So I think the important thing one is be proud of say that you should know what I know, what I'm good at what I can stand up and say to the people that I have a skill in this, I know this, number one. Uh, number two is I think uh, we have, looking at all the data analysis I saw, be very technology savvy. Don't think that I'm not a computer graduate, therefore I don't need, I don't need to know computer. Any field in technology savvy is gonna help because people are working in future that we don't need to use the bank. I have. Groups of people, private sector investors, startup working who said, you know, the ATM will be useless because they're going to act. You should be able, you will be able to go to a driver, taxi driver, and say, okay, I pay my bill on this. There's your phone. And by the way, give me also $30. They'll give it to you. They want to make completely redundant. They're working on it. This is happening. So knowing this technology, know how, which, and the third, which is related to the first two in some way is, have your ability to learn. If you have, cannot learn as you move on, I don't think you can survive. You, then you have to define your periphery. I'm going to be selling orange for the next 30 years. It's okay. But you have to keep up with the, with the development of the world. You have to, my, my one example, as I, as I mentioned during the long time, when I graduated from AIT with the PhD, I didn't know much about finance. I didn't know much. But they made me the vice president of finance ADB. But before that, they say, you go and learn in Chicago. You do this, you do that. Uh, but if I had no skill to learn, it looks like I had it, which I didn't know. I was able to learn that. And then they appointed me the vice president of finance, something I had never, ever dreamt in my life. I would be the CFO of a $15 billion bank. But then that also showed me that, hey, I have some learning ability by going to the class, sitting in the class, listening and so on. I think this learnability, which I mentioned, is very, very important. These are the three things that comes to my mind at this point in time. Um, middle income country trap. I think the way things are, we are looking at the moment, unless these, many of these middle income countries like Thailand, Vietnam, Philippines, Indonesia, et cetera, make some change, as I mentioned, uh, in innovation, in higher education, in making a plan for future. Uh, 
it's not going to happen. Uh, the last one in Asia, which uh, was the best example to me, is the Korea. And you see, I'm, I'm giving you one example. The Korean, I, I can talk several hours, but the Korean example. Korea said, okay, uh, this is from, uh, my boss was the deputy prime minister who became a vice president of ADB, whom, whose job I had. He told me the following. This is, uh, the Korean government just sat down and said, that, okay, a lot of think tank, et cetera, will brought in to say, where we have competitive advantage or competitive advantage in future. Uh, on the other side, the three, four areas. We want to go on shipbuilding. At a time when Japan has 80% of the market share, 88 or 80%. We want to go into ICT, and we're going to go manufacturing. And I told you, in that 1999, 35% of the graduates were in those fields. Then we said, we must develop our manpower to be able to do all by ourselves. That's the important, the technology effort. In the beginning, there'll be FDI, fine, but eventually that uh, you should be able to do on your own. I don't think, I haven't seen that kind of commitment in the middle income committee. Income. We have to get out from this, for lack of a better word, the black box or the commission agent mentality. Somebody comes to FDI, I dig it my commission, the guy takes it, that will not make it happen. So that's the last example I can do. Portugal, I, uh, Asia, I'm more familiar. Portugal, I know it did the last one, but uh, in Asia, after the Korea, I don't think anyone is in near that yet, but all these countries, Vietnam, Thailand, Indonesia, Philippines, they all have potential. It's a question of whether they will do it. Some countries have done a great job. Like I read the other day, that Thailand has said, all international university anywhere in the world, they can come and establish campus here. That's, that's one good economic regime policy. That might help to bring the quality of education high, which in the, you saw in the ranking in the tertiary education is not that great. It's not that great. So these are not my data. These are all global data, and I just analyze them. And back to Mo's question is uh, very relevant. Uh, I go back to our our old days. <laughs> we keep on saying when this camp this was established, Seattle, NATO. Where I think the reason didn't have postgraduate institutions. And I think U.S., most of the time, I think they, they do good things. This is one good thing. They will train people here so that they will be useful for the future. Many, U.S. probably is the best example of training lots of students globally with scholarship. And I think reaping the benefit because we are professor so-and-so's uh, student, et cetera. And that relationship builds forever. Right? So they invested a lot on, on this, this question. And I think at that time there was a sincere desire for the, for the donors countries to help developing countries to come up. Because especially if your poor countries come up, it's good for business, it's good for everything else as well. It's, it's also a hidden agenda, it's also good for business. But there is a time when I do remember talk, sitting at the not here sitting on the other job. The donors now are questioning that. They think Asia is the competitor. Uh, and they, their mind, most of the public citizens think, they think of China. They think of India. They, they, they're, they're still the American citizens in fact, don't think of Laos, Cambodia so much, but they think of, oh, Asia is a competitor. When the Asia is a competitor, it's China. And one, one friend of mine said, Bindu, why should I train these Asian people to have masters and PhD when my own countrymen are not going for masters and PhD? How do you explain to the taxpayer? I mean, this is a valid question. What do I, how do I answer that question now if I want to go and ask money from the donor? So what Dr. Warsak said this morning, I think we have to try to change the business model. There is a lot of rich Asian, there are a lot of rich alumni, there are a lot of philanthropies which will come in, maybe we need to try to change the model to generate more resource as much as possible within Asia. 
definitely. But that doesn't mean we should not go. And there are, what I see is a tremendous opportunity. When I was sitting at ADB, I didn't have to go raise money. People gave it to us. Because the activity that we did, it was also useful for them. Whenever I needed, uh, when I wanted some money for climate research, then I, I, can't, I said, okay, the American University so-and-so is very good in climate research. I want to work jointly with them. Would you fund it? I had no problem funding it. They will fund their university, I'll get it. So the business model definitely will, will, will tap the chain. Second, I think we, if we are able to establish some knowledge, deep expertise, brand name, I think, and do some good research, people will come. A good example is your own, the way when you were here, geotechnical, all the work in geotechnical in Nepal were done by your students from geotechnical university. There were none in the region. And today they are very prosperous. But today now they're saying, gosh, I wish I had learned tunneling technology. I wish I had learned how to do a metro, right? So we have to be able to catch up those new areas, new hungry uh, people who are wanting that to learn. Right? And that, I think, means reorientation a bit here and there. Um, I think there's also the possibility, I think I was uh, looking one Surendra's presentation going to Indonesia and say Indonesia will be able to give so many scholarships. This morning, there was a presentation of the future. Uh, every country has a huge HR money, uh, the training money. And we have to go and pitch that we can provide that service, AIT is a service, that to you, you have to pitch that model. Uh, some you will succeed, some you will not. You will be you in the consulting, you know you put uh, 10 proposals, you might win two, you're happy. We pitch 10, 15, we, we pitch for 2 million, we get 100,000, we're happy. So I think this continuous pitching with ideas with uh, which government uh, sometimes is not thinking is very important. Uh, my best model for that is I think you are recording, but cut that out. The McKinsey model. Uh, when I was told by the, one of my McKinsey friends that when they go to see a CEO of a client, their briefing manual is fantastic. What they need to know is, globally they write, I'm going to Indonesia, tell me what you know. What I should be telling to the president. Uh, what you think the president knows already, but what you president doesn't know which you should know and you pitch. Mr. President, you correct what you say, but with all due respect, let me tell you, this is an area you have in focus. You need to train a lot of people in tertiary education, in technology, maybe in robotics, I don't know what that is, and you, we can help. When you say we can help, you must really have a back office to be able to help. Otherwise, you'll be back home. So I think you need, you need a total different approach, a little bit of like consulting, a little bit that talking from strength, that we know this field. We want to tell you, you are our Asian country, you are my friend, you are my alumni, you know, believe me, this is good. I think this kind of uh, way, I think it will work. And the third group of people, I'm sure there are a lot of philanthropists, etc., cetera, people who can raise money. Uh, Dr. Warsak's library is a good example. You wanted some 50 million, you got some 78 million. Great success story. There are stories. So the model has to change. But I would continue to go to the West and tell them, look, I'll tell the Japanese, this was built by you in 1974. I attended the first conference here as a government official in this. You know, this has gone down. It's a prestige of the Japanese to restore it back. I think that like Yamamoto, you should tell the government to build the next building because it's your pride, right? Uh, how would, would you want to see it drown completely? I don't want to see it completely drown. So I think, I think you have this whole cells perspective uh, that you need to bring in. The, we cannot just be say we are professors and people will come and give money to us. I think that model will not happen in my opinion. Okay. There's a question at the back. I think I talked a lot about this. But I'm, all I'm saying is our model will have to change and we must make much bigger attempt within the region, but not forgetting that there are still friends uh, and 
and, and countries who would be willing to do it for us in the yeah oh sorry i provoked you i think dr amara <laughs> thank you very much uh picture and i would uh i i had to ask your suggestion and opinion because I, I i totally agree that we should hire uh, excellent professors and faculty and this excellent professor leads L&D project and get funds and then uh, to uh, install the high quality instrument. This is, uh, this is in sequence uh, to make a su successful development of the institute. But uh, I think that this one is, uh, uh, we, we don't, uh, not necessarily to hire ready-made excellent professor. Then uh, this should be grown here. So uh, here, excellent faculty should be grown at AIT. So uh, we need to. I think we need to focus to uh, promote young researcher uh, faculty to be uh, great, and then uh, to make uh, disruptive innovations. Then this is individual. Uh, ability is very important and we need to consider to hire this uh, potential young researchers. And I'd like to ask your opinion and suggestion. But, uh, most, but uh, I think we need to have uh, some uh, priority. Anyhow, as you mentioned, uh, uh, this kind of the cutting edge research is not everywhere. We should select. But, but I think, uh, I think, but I totally agree in the future uh, institute is knowledge uh, institute is a kind of we need uh, knowledge based on the big data management. Then I think, uh, 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 how, how do you th uh, what do you think about uh, if the institu institutional investment, if we have a priority and then uh, probably we focus first some investment which promote faculty to manage big data, big data acquisition or management of big, big data. I'd like to ask your opinion. I, I hope I understood the question, but uh, uh, first you saying that we don't need to hire, or we don't need to have very seasoned uh, professor here, that's what's saying, but we need to hire younger people. Is that thinking? Okay. I think we, it all needs to back up first. Let's, let's back up and say, uh, this morning, uh, Dr. in the board, not all of you heard, but uh, Dr. Dachimo said, we must have, if we are going to teach uh, some field, environmental engineering, you must need some equipment for learning, minimum equipment. And then, then you recruited me. Let's say I'm a professor. I like gas chromatography. That's going to cost me $2 million for that equipment. Then you have to make, if I were the dean, I will say, sorry, I don't have $2 million. Maybe this is not the research we can afford. But teaching all the equipment we must have. So you, you, the professors usually have, maybe I had the same maybe, if I'm in grass chromatography, I like to analyze heavy metals, etc. I like to keep, and if I am the most powerful guy in the department, I keep on buying that equipment on another one, another one, another one. I don't care what others do. Uh, yeah, this is faculty researcher are by uh, our nature, a little bit selfish in our, what, what we know, what I want to do, what I want to do. We can't afford that anymore. We have to set the priority. If the ICT is a priority, and this is where we want to make our name, then you need to sit down and say, okay, we want to hire faculty in disruptive technology, maybe robotics, maybe artificial intelligence sector, and then our curriculum also will be designed accordingly. Uh, many, I know some universities uh, who is completely got out for some areas, they say, I can't afford the lab anymore, so I'm, I don't have, want to have that field. Okay, maybe environmental engineering laboratory is so expensive. So as an example, 
okay, I, I'm not teaching laboratory course. I'm moving into policy, and I'm gonna I'm gonna be like Harvard Kennedy School, talking policy, public policy, but not teach, and so on. These are choices we need to do, based on uh, available resources, based on where what do we want to be known for. My view always had been, no university in the world gets become become excellent in every area. Okay, if it's Harvard, uh, they're good in law, they're good in medicine, they're good in economics. I never hired a Harvard graduate for my environmental team in ADB. I could have hired many, but I, I would hire from some other university where they were very good, right? So there are certain areas. We need to build that. As I said, we had a, such a great name in geotechnical, such a great name in structural, such a great name in water. Uh, we need to revisit, do we still want to build that? Or do we want the new one? That we want to be the artificial intelligence, the robotics of the future. This exercise needs to be done. Money is limited in every university. And then whether you hire a new young guy um, who is just scratching, he's very smart, but he needs research money and you can't give any money. That's why I said, if I had the 20 million, I'd like to give each $1 million to this guy, okay. Like the Chinese approach, they brought a very distinguished biotech professor and said, oh, here is your lab. The, the, for the next five years you do outstanding research, don't even ask me. Just do this, this, give me the product. You should be able to do that. You can get a young guy and say, okay, I don't have money, please write $100,000 proposal and do something. It doesn't work. It doesn't work in University of Tokyo. It doesn't work anywhere. So you need to make that decision in my opinion on that. Uh, having said that, big data part. You know, big data, I'm, I'm not talking about the big data, as a professor of big data is the only one, then you will say we have a professor of big data. It's just like a computer, everybody should know how to use computer. Every department should be able to look at the big data, big data in energy, in transport, in urban, and maybe centralize it, look at it together. Uh, it's, it's not a professor of big data. Yeah, we might need that too. But have that mindset in the student's mind, in the faculty mind, in the department, my school's mind, that we need to be able to analyze big data. If we're teaching urbanization, once to look at the MIT Sensible Lab, see how they are analyzing all this data, how people are moving, how they are traveling, how the car is happening, these and, and be able to make the decisions further. That's, that, that's what I'm saying for every field, whether it's water, energy, transport, and so on. That's a lot of exchange. I may not be perfect, but uh, yes, this lady. Um, my question is about the middle income trap. Yeah. Uh, well, on the one hand, we're talking about breaking the middle income trap for Asia and moving from a traditional economy to a more like knowledge, uh, innovation based and technology driven economy. But on the other hand, uh, the Asian society is increasingly like shifting towards a middle income group with growing demands, which would need investment for the expansion of the industrial as well as the agricultural sector. So how do we limit this increasing demand for natural resources and strive for economic growth and sustainable development in this region at the same time? A very good question. In fact, uh, you know that report I showed you on the structural transformation addresses that kind of questions. Obviously from agriculture, we, we all agree that from agriculture people will move to some degree of industrialization to have some stable uh, like, for example, there were some studies done, we say, if you don't have a steel industry in the country, uh, there are so many things you will not be able to do that. You can't make this chair, you may not be able to make some plates. It's so many, it automatically constrains you, right? So there is a whole, a very nice study, Harvard study, which links, every, if you have this industry, this thousand products you can develop on your own, right? There's a lot of, lot of studies there. So you correct from the middle income group is rising. Because of that, the consumption lays growth is high. This is happening in China, this is happening even in Nepal, I see people are very poor, 25, 27% are below poverty, but the middle income is thriving. They have disposable incomes. The restaurants are more expensive than in Thailand. Poor country. 
So it's the disposable income high. But then I also question where is the disposable income coming from? Whether it's formal money or informal money, uh, money laundering, corruption. So you have to look in a bigger picture. So yes, I'm a strong believer that you need to have a industrial base. You can't completely, I, I made one statement, some countries have moved from directly from agriculture to service. And therefore they don't have a, they don't have a stable industrial base. Example, I think Philippines. Uh, Philippines back in 60s, 70s, 80s was the industrial, strong country, many industries moved. And they wanted the IT, a service sector. So what happens, service sector today, you have call center, this center, that center, appliance, and when the labor market, when the prices go up, they move to Vietnam, when the Vietnam become expensive, they go to Laos, then we're someday in Nepal. So this is a low end service thing which Asia is adopting. Even Indians are now, I'm surprised that even they are outsourcing the low end job to the others. So this is naturally happening, right? So you have to be very careful moving into this, the service sector that you don't end up doing the low end job forever. Maybe in the beginning, okay. And Nepalis are now doing, making a lot of apps for and sending to US, Japan, China. But the day will come, they will become expensive and they'll go to Africa maybe, right? So you have to be looking from that perspective. So in, in short, uh, it doesn't mean that you get out zero to agriculture. Some countries have actually. They don't produce, Singapore doesn't produce anything agriculture, zero, right? And because their concept is if I have money, I should be able to buy globally. Now that may not be true for a country like China, may not be true for Thailand. Thailand does a very good job on agriculture. So you have to find a balance between where my agriculture products are gonna be competitive or competitive advantage, where, where, which industry I want to have. That's why I showed you when to de-industrialize. Garment industry is a great example. You do it, after a while they take it to the poor country. They de-industrialize and they move into the high-end service sector. So there's no perfect magic. Some countries are 52% service, 20% industry and so on. There is no magic number, but those analysis will have to be done on a country by country basis. The chart I showed you, countries which have not industrialized, which industrialize already, which need to de-industrialize. Uh, that report has all those analysis. It's a very good question, by the way. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Dr. Lahani, very impressive. I learned a lot from your slides. In fact, I took some photo. Since you talk about AIT, I think we have been at AIT together a long time <laughs> back <laughs> as colleagues. Of course, you uh, went to ADB, I continue, I get stuck in AIT, cannot go anywhere. But I learned, you know, this one, one the, I call it the paradox at AIT, you know, that I try to find a solutions even now. You know, when we talk to the professors, the professor said, uh, AT have to have a very high quality faculty, and with this salary, uh, you cannot afford to, to attract somebody, you know, very, very uh, highly renowned. So we need to, to raise our salary. Then we talk to the students. The students said, uh, "This is your your job is to help us. You know, we are poor. We are good, but we are we are poor." So you, you, you please help us by lower your tuition. The, the kind of tuition you charge, impossible for us to pay. Okay, so, so the, there's a big gap. If we want to be very good, if we want to serve the, 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 the countries around this region well, of course we, we need this, this kind of money to fill the gap. And of course in the old day, you know, the, this region is still considered to be a bit lower than the developed country. So money comes from more developed country to, to support students and also so that the tuition will be used to high faculty. But I think the better we do our job, 
the sooner we will lose our job because this region become more developed. Then we don't have the job to do. You know? And if, if that is so, you know, how, how can we, in a long run, you know, the country like Myanmar, Laos, Cambodia, they could also start to be in the middle income tax. And if every, every country, you know, move up, then the, perhaps AAT doesn't have any role to play because those countries will have their own world-class university. So how do you handle this? Or advise me how to handle this? Thank you. Okay. There were two more questions here. Tuba wanted a question? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Dr. Tony, oh. if I can. Oh, for before that, you? Yeah. Dr. Tony, actually, uh, this is also being broadcast live. Okay. And uh, many alumni had requested to listen to your talk. So at the moment, actually, 27 people are watching. And we got one question from an alumni. It's similar to Dr. Nelson's question. Uh, the question is, there are many countries who depend on agricultural economy and would continue decades to transform their agricultural economy into industry. How does your KBE idea help them boost their agricultural economy? Thank you. Okay, very good. Uh, Mr. Morita. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Bindu. Uh, during my uh, long life, I've been with you and I run a lot, almost every day. And today I'm again running from you. Uh, thank you. Now, a uh, question of uh, uh, middle income uh, country trap or low income, high income. The question uh, I think uh, uh, is not the question of whether you are low income or high, high income. Whether you are uh, trapped or not is not the question. The question is, even if you move up to the next rank, what do you do with that money? It's more important. I think in terms of uh, education. Uh, at one occasion, I was invited uh, to one of the seminars uh, where many of the scholars been uh, commending to that country that uh, you have done very good job, now you become middle income country. My st statement was, so what? After you become the middle income country, achieving above $1,000, are you going to celebrate again another seminar once more if you reach $1,100, $1,200 kind of things? The question is therefore not the matter of the wealth for the country. And of course, as you said, what is the answer? You said good research. The money should be spent for the good research. This is uh, very important in my view. And uh, all of what you said today, good, good part of, I mean, the conclusion is this good research and what kind of knowledge you achieve. Now, uh, this is uh, uh, my uh, uh, question. What kind of knowledge you acquire? This is very important, of course, you like to be always relevant to your community. Uh, likewise, a country with full knowledge needs to be relevant to the rest of the community. Now, in that context, Asia, we have so many different categories of the economy and country. Agriculture, industrialized, uh, some fisheries, so many communities. Each community requires the uh, additional new knowledge. Now, what do you think? In case of the country like uh, Thailand, as an example, uh, which is in transition uh, in many aspects, and the uh, expectation from the international community is very high. Of course, we know what India is going to be, and we know what China is going to be. But for the country like Thailand, where we stay here, uh, I like to know exactly uh, what you think, because okay. AIT is located right here. Incidentally, 
like money, people have mobility. And uh, together with the people, knowledge moves. So that means, unlike the factory or unlike the land, the knowledge has a really a vehicle for vehicles to move, move around. In that context, AIT is best situated because we are international school and we can really uh, transfer knowledge from one place to the other. But coming back to my question, what do you think the direction, the uh, education that Thailand requires in specific? Okay, good. Okay, let's, shall we, do we have time? We exceeded our time already. One more, okay. I'm, 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 well. I'm sorry, because the mass shows that uh, we have to go. But still, I'll raise the question, and not compulsorily, you may have to answer. Dr. Looney, uh, as you told in our earlier slides, the gap between the skill set that universities are producing and the industries are requiring. There is a gap. Here, my question is, whose responsibility is it? The industry or the academic institutions themselves? Because a research by Forbes in 2012 shows that top 10 jobs in 2012 did not even exist in 2004. That would mean today if academic institutions are com competing so hard to produce the skill set to match the industry, still we cannot guarantee after 10 years down the line we may not have those jobs in the market. So my question is who should invest on the mm. skill set gap, one. I, one more. One more, okay. Uh, related to knowledge management. The thing is that, what is the best way to preserve and disseminate the knowledge? Because why should we invest again the same amount of dollar to produce one more Bindu Lohani in a whole lifetime? I want to be one Bindulani, one Professor Warsak, or one uh, Professor Jakal in my lifetime, a combo with the knowledge management. Why not? If again we have to invest the same amount to become next Bindulani in the whole lifetime, then where comes this knowledge management? Mm. Thank you. Okay, probably you don't want me. You don't want to be like me. You don't want I to mean, be like other people. Okay, right? ABC. Okay, good, 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 good. I think because I'm concerned about the times, but I'm quite happy to take any number, even after. Tuba, there's still one hand, lady, okay? Uh, thank you, Dr. Lohani. My question is about uh, your advices to young graduates or young people. The question it came into my mind that in response to your advice is that we routinely witness that who you know matters more than what you know. And we face this in uh, current scenarios more often. So what is your advice to, uh, to deal such situations or what young graduates can do to handle such situations that who you know matters more than what you know? Who you know matters more than what you know. Okay. And then who, what you know? Okay, Let, let's start. Uh, first, the most difficult one, Dr. What's our question? Uh, uh, AIT may not have the job to do someday. I mean, if every university is have uh, excellent university like us. Uh, we asked this question, I think, at the ADB also many times said that we may not need, there will be no borrowers someday. Country will be reached by themselves. And therefore, we, we always say our success is to be out of the business the day we close. And Mr. Morita will remember, uh, in the early days, we lend money to Singapore, even to Malaysia, to even some to Hong Kong, to Thailand. You know, Thailand doesn't borrow anymore now. It doesn't need it. So the fact of life is, you have to think that there will be you have to have 
therefore a new target. So Mr. Morita went and opened India operations, somebody went and opened China operations, some went to Central Asia, looked for the market, and today we are much bigger than ever before. So it is strategic thinking and making it happen. Uh, I would, if you still want to same, sell the same program which you sold, which we sold together maybe 20 years, 30 years ago, we may have no client. We saw some of the application coming down in some areas because they think, uh, I don't need to go to spend all the money, I can get it at home. This will, we don't get a student anymore from Korea, very hardly few. Uh, in those days we had so many from Taiwan, we don't get any more. Uh, we used to get from Malaysia, Singapore, for two reasons. One, affordability. They think, uh, I, can, I, I can now shop anywhere in the world. So they can pay the fees in the US, UK. Secondly, some of the universities, they have really developed pretty good themselves, like NUS. And it happened, Dr. Warsak, it happened, why, how NUS could come up so quickly in Singapore? Because government pumped a lot of money. Bring excellent faculty, wherever. Excellent faculty, not because, they say, what's your price? The, if I remember the Lee Kuan Yew School, where I have some involvement, uh, public school, they went and said, okay, we pay you a million dollar, but we need you to come out about half a dozen times, advise our people. That's the power of money. I think the in academics also, any, any academician anywhere in the world, you may be able to get for a week, one term, six months, one year, depending on the possible, at a price. So, question is, uh, and then back, worse like said, the faculty is saying our salary is not enough. There's a study, very interesting study. I used to handle the finance and administration. One of my job was uh, salary, HR, and so on for four years. And then we hired some companies like um, one of those top companies to say, look, our ADB people are very unhappy about their salary and benefit. Can you advise? When you compare, when I saw, I thought this is, already one of the best, but students were unhappy. Then the first thing he told me is, you have to assume that based on the survey of all the companies in the world, no company has employees which will say, I'm happy with my salary and benefit. You, you won't find anybody, I'm very happy with my salary. I think they all think they need more than what they deserve. But then you also need to look at the market, competitive, uh, little bit market. To me, I don't know what day I decided. To me, if I am not able to, this will be my hypothesis for testing. If I'm not able to get the best faculty from India, they may, who, who cares about being hired based on salary? Of course, some people say, I don't want to leave my country. I say, those are not. Let's say there are people who are willing to move based on salary. If we are not able to hire people, best people from India, Thailand, uh, for that matter, Sri Lanka, and many developing countries, something is wrong. We must be able to get the best faculty from Asia, wherever, and be able to attract them. And if our price is that low, change it. That's my view. You may have few, but change it. You may not be able to able to get somebody from the West who's got on a big salary. You may be able to bring in for a week, if that is important, two weeks. So there's nothing like a, nothing like a best salary, but uh, we have to be able to make a benchmark. Like in ADB, we say, we compare with the World Bank. If the World Bank uh, people uh, we, we have the same market, so we compete, we can compete. But here, I think the benchmark to me is, I repeat again, is we should be able to get the best, at least the best faculty from Asia. If I cannot hire a, even I should be able to hire a from Japan, frankly, although they will not come because they have so many advantages, other hidden advantages and they may not come, but that should be the salary structure we should design. Uh, going out of the business is a matter of lack of vision, lack of strategy. I think I, you, you, in academic institutions, should, unlike the ADB, you say we want to be out of business. A, AD, academic institutions say we want to remain in the business and we will continue to perform to remain in the business. 
even it means someday AIT become with one field of study on Asian issue of ICT or technology and innovation. What do we teach? Nothing wrong. If we have 2,000 students just studying ICT, innovation, I'm just giving an example, innovation and entrepreneurship, and you think that this is where we got the world's best or Asia's best, that's fine. I don't need 33 field of study average. It's a question. I mean, these are, these are questions to ponder and, and, and make, uh, make the choices. Uh, and I think there will always be, we have to be, we were, I think we at AIT was established with a passion to help the countries which really are weak. Uh, it doesn't bother me that the, the Singaporeans don't come here anymore, but it'll bother me if we're not able to help countries like Laos today, Vietnam to some extent, uh, maybe Myanmar, Nepal, maybe few other countries which have weak. And they, it will, I think the next 20 years we have business with them. Even if they have one bell, best world university, I think we should be able to help. But the key to that, I'm a strong believer for the next five years, as I said, we need to increase more and more full scholarship because we are a service. We're providing this as a service. And that is kind of, thinking we need. I, I don't think we'll go out of business. We question is, well, how do we go further up? Because you've done people, uh, you all have done a great job. You're bringing AIT to your point. It can go down and it should not go down. It should just go up. But the someday we may have difficulty, in my opinion, getting students from Thailand. Thailands are getting rich and they have choices. Why would they come? I want to go abroad. I know Thailand very much. I want to see what Australia is like. So question is, I'm not bothered with that. I, I think I remember my trip to Vietnam when we were talking to some people. Uh, somebody asked me a question. You know, we are now rich. We can go and study in US, Australia. Very good, please go. We, the group, the next group of people said, yes, as long as uh, I'm poor, I don't have money to go. I want to study in Asia. And my dream is to come back and help my country. I think, please come to AIT. The guy's bright. In first case, was a rich guy, not necessarily bright. Affordability for education there. He can buy education anywhere in the world. The second guy was a bright guy, poor, wanting to help the country. I want to give the admission to that guy. But I don't have enough scholarship. So let's increase that. Let's find out how to do that more in future. That's a long, I don't think there's a definite view on this, but this is just the exchange of the views between us. Uh, second question was uh, uh, agriculture, industry to, that question, right? The, somebody said in the process of agriculture, industrial sector, it will take time for countries to become from agriculture. And that's true, it will become. But what the guy is forgetting, I think what he should remember is Agriculture from planting rice to agro-industry is already a value added. Thailand is, in my opinion, a great example. When I was a student here, what agriculture product they had versus today agro-industry, they're exporting all over the world. So that's industrialization with agro. So it doesn't mean industry mean no, agri no agro-industry. It is a part of that. <coughs> to me, at least in this region, Thailand is a great model how they have moved into agro-industries, value-added and exported the whole region. The next question was, uh, Rich, oh, Marita San, Marita's question, which is uh, very, very difficult to, again. Yes, we have, you, you and I have seen very much that the countries were very rich, well in middle-income countries, but that doesn't mean the quality of the life of the people was better. We've seen that. And uh, we can mention the exact countries where such thing happened. The wealth is there. And that's where one of the slides on the mega challenge which uh, LDB did was disparity in inequality. I think Asia's biggest problem today is not so much poverty, but poverty with inequality. The, you know, the, the, the rich and poor the gap is very, very wide. And that is not necessarily translating into the quality of life of the mass of the citizens as a whole. And that 
Mr. Morita, I, I don't need to tell you, that is really a better success, better measurement than the GDP or middle income number. Um, so I just saw that this slide doesn't mean I, I only believe in that parameter, but it's important to look at the other quality of life, whether people are better. And middle income or even high income people may not be the happy people. And uh, I don't believe so much in happiness index, but if you look at the happiness index, Philippine comes third in the world, I think, and Brazil comes number one. People are happy. So to me, more than happening, the quality of life, not necessarily of the citizens may be better with the middle income country, but with the right kind of framework, it is possible to do that. And you said, well, I, if I have any advice for Thailand. You know, by the way, I must say that my, in my presentation, I, there are so many other things of, related to knowledge based economy wants to do. My focus was only one thing, the importance of science, technology, innovation and entrepreneurship in this area. I'm very convinced, and I, 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 and I think for the next number of years we can think of, if we produce people with technology savvy, science, technology, innovation, entrepreneurship, a mind which can say, I want to be employed by myself rather than I'm looking for employment. I think that kind of mind would, would be something. And I think the, um, Thailand really, because all the data I have looked at on uh, Thailand, Thailand need to have a lots of knowledge hub and science technology like Singapore did, Korea did, if it, it wants to get into that kind of area with high masters and PhDs supported by the knowledge hubs, the research in that one, that one area is essential. There are other areas, that area essential, and there is a gap in, in all these countries. And that's why I say there's a business opportunity for AIT to be there in Indonesia, Philippines, uh, even Thailand, and so and Vietnam, and so on and so forth. But we need to be able to be prepared there. Uh, this gentleman question, skill versus degree, whose responsibility is that? I think you write the 10 jobs uh, that you have now may disappear. Uh, it did disappear. You know, when, when we were in uh, uh, 40 years ago, 30 years ago when I was at ADB, we had a job called uh, fax message dispatcher. The guy's whole day job was a fax message taking to the various people who got the fax. Do we need that job now? We don't need it. We don't need it. Uh, there was a job like a messenger whose job was to bring something. And in many of the job will disappear, will and that will continue to happen with the robotics and so on. So how do we prepare? You asked a very important question. How do, what do I do? What do I need to do is, the, in a way, the academics curriculum that you design, if you're teaching 20 years old curriculum, it's very unfair to the students. You need to go back to the employer. Like if, if I'm an um, ICT graduate, let's say, it's like Shreya. Uh, we need to go, the faculty, students, the team here need to go and talk to the Googles, talk to the uh, IBMs, to the consulting company and say, by the way, what kind of graduates you're looking for? What kind of skills you're looking for? And they might tell you, you know, I'm looking in Thailand, so many people with the knowledge, with skills on big data, I can't find it. So I'm bringing a lot of people from India. That's what's happening in the US. It's also cheap, by the way. Uh, that's why I'm employing for foreigners or sector. Singapore brings a lot of things from India because they say, well, look, I can't get my people to learn this for the time being, it may change. So the point I'm making is in your teaching, in your curriculum, you need to consult not only the literature review of the journals and so on, where this, where this research is going. If you want to produce those graduates with a skill for employment, like you ask, you go and ask them. And they will tell you, please teach this, I, need, I want your skill to know this, and design your curriculum change your curriculum, revamp your curriculum, throw your curriculum, put a new one if necessary, to say that this is what is the need of my client today. That's the only way you can do. Okay, and the last two bars question was, um, who you know matters more than what you know? 
I hope you've, you've, you've not experienced like that. I think it is very important, very important to know what you know. Uh, who is in today's world can introduce. If, if, uh, if you are really great, very good, uh, finding a first job is always extremely difficult to anybody in, in, in anybody's life. So what people can do is, who you know means, you know, I know there's a lady called Tuba, which is really good. If you're looking for one, there she is. They call introduction. So you, after that, it's your job. It's your job. But it is not a favoritism. I won't send Tuba to a friend of mine who wants a person like you if I know you're not good. But so you have to make sure you are good. And in the area you are good, it's perfectly okay for the people who know you or or who know another person to introduce you, here is a good girl you may want to hire. After that is your business and his, his or her business. But uh, don't, don't get that wrong impression that I need to know contact before I can job. You can get the job, but you'll be fired after a few months. And I've done fired from people like that in my lifetime because they were, I didn't know they were hired because of connections and the performance was low, you're fired. You don't want to be in that category. That's the very harsh reply. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, I think we've done all the questions unless there are last burning questions. Uh, uh, to me, it's been a very, very interesting uh, session. Uh, don't take everything I said uh, as correct. This is view. This is for exchange. And if you have some better views, please send an email to me uh, because I want to learn also. And I, I want to continuously learn to be able to uh, know a little bit more and increase my knowledge in future. Thank you very much for the opportunity, uh, Dr. Subin, uh, Dr. Warshak, very much. Cup and cap. Thank you very much for the interesting talk today. As a token of our appreciation, may I please request Dr. Subin Bin Kayan, the chairman of the AIT Board of Trustee, and Mr. Surendra Shrestha, Vice President for Development, to kindly present a memento to Dr. Bindu Lohani. I haven't been to the classroom for many, many years. This is the first time I was sitting as a student, uh, listening to the, the professor lecturing. I really enjoyed very much. You know, the way I follow up his lecture, I myself believe that uh, technology changes every day you know, what people call the, uh, the future of our life is the, depend on the interruption, interruption of the technology. So this is when I got a message from his talk, I was thinking what I should do. You know, when he, his, one of his keywords, he said something, I said, yeah, I want to do. I, fo I didn't follow what he said. So I woke I up again, another keyword. So I follow up. But the last uh, slide he showed me, he woke, I, it woke me up. That's what he said, that AIT is the world-class technology-based institute. That thing woke me up. <laughs> so as the chairman of the board, of the, what I should do? <laughs> so I think we can do. Please to be selective. 
things that the, you can do, the earlier that you can do. And there is a need of uh, that issue. So please select it and identify the need of the people of, of the people or the society and you should be able to do it. But another thing is that the last one that he said we said that if we are the best, you know, and no and we don't know what to do because we already did that. So you go to find the problem, find the need. The need of the human being is there. You, you have to change it to, to find the need and then you solve the problem of that needs. And thank you very much. We have now come to the end of the seminar. We would like to thank you for the spending your time with us this afternoon. I hope you all enjoyed the program today. You are all invited for refreshment, which will be served outside the auditorium in the main lobby. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.